In this video, I will give a general introduction to 1D hydrodynamic models, covering the governing equations, variously described as the saint venant equations, the shallow water equations, and the dynamic wave approximation. We'll look at what each of the terms in the equations describe, and I'll define simplifications to the equations used in some models, namely the diffusion wave and kinematic wave approximations. Finally, we will look at the assumptions embedded in 1D hydrodynamic models and when they might be violated. There are many circumstances in which we are interested in shallow water flow, where we define shallow to mean that the water depth is small compared to the horizontal reach of the water. Examples of this type of flow include natural channels such as rivers and streams. Generally, these have highly variable cross-sectional shapes and tend to meander. They can also be artificial channels such as farm ditches and canals, which tend to be straighter and have a more uniform cross-section. When modelling such channels, a first approximation is to treat the flow as one-dimensional, by which we refer only to the spatial dimension. This is effectively an assumption that the vertical accelerations and hydrostatic pressure are negligible and that the streamline curvature is small. Let's break this down in a little more detail. The assumption of one spatial dimension means that we have a single value for the depth at any point along the channel. Thus we effectively assume the water level across the cross section is horizontal. The assumption that vertical accelerations are negligible implies that the velocity is uniform across the cross-section and doesn't vary with depth. We also need to make some assumption about the slope and frictional forces. There are a number of choices for modelling friction, such as assuming Manning's equation is valid for representing resistance effects. For the cases we're going to consider here, we also assume that the slope is gentle and, since we are dealing with water, we assume that the fluid is incompressible. These assumptions lead us to the saint venant equations, named after the 19th century mathematician and mechanician Ademar Jean-Claude Barré de saint venant which we are going to look at in some detail here. The saint venant equations are a pair of partial differential equations in which the dependent variables are discharge and depth, and the independent variables are distance along the channel and time. Solutions to these equations provide discharge time and depth time relationships along the channel. Unfortunately, the equations are non-linear and analytical solutions are not possible for most conditions, and we have to resort to numerical methods. Thus, we evaluate discharge and depth at discrete points along the length of a channel at discrete times. In this illustration, we are using four points along the reach. So, let's have a look at the equations. We have conservation of mass, also known as the continuity equation, and conservation of momentum. Note that the momentum equation is non-linear which is what makes these equations difficult to solve. Let's unravel this by looking at the individual terms. The first term in the continuity equation, giving the rate of change of discharge in the flow direction, can be considered an input-output term. The second term in the continuity equation is the rate of change of storage with respect to time. And the term on the right hand side of the equation is a source term representing the net lateral inflow. Moving on to the momentum equation, we have a local acceleration term and a convective acceleration term. Collectively, these two terms relate to the inertial force. Next, we have a pressure force term. 
And finally, we have a gravity force and friction force term. These two terms, sometimes written on the right-hand side of the equation, are also source terms. In order to run a simulation, i.e. define a problem, we need an initial condition, for example a known discharge and depth along the domain length at time t equals naught, and two boundary conditions. Examples include a known discharge into the channel, which could be a fixed value, or an upstream hydrograph such as the one shown here, or a tidal depth downstream which is a known function of time, or simply a fixed depth downstream, an open boundary or a flat water surface. In some circumstances, there are simplifications we can make to the equations which make them easier to solve. This complete form of the governing equations are sometimes referred to as the dynamic wave equations. They describe unsteady, non-uniform flow. If the pressure, gravity and frictional forces dominate, i.e. the last three terms in the momentum equation are much greater than the inertial force terms, we can simplify the momentum equation by ignoring the first two terms. This is known as a diffusive wave or diffusion wave approximation. The momentum equation thus reduces to dh by dx equals s0 minus q mod q over k squared. Since we are ignoring the acceleration terms, this is essentially an assumption of steady non-uniform flow. This approximation is useful when there's primarily subcritical flow with low Froude numbers, since the inertial force is much smaller than the other forces in such cases. For a given initial condition and an inflow hydrograph such as the one shown here, this approximation would produce a solution that looks something like this. Here, only the values of discharge are shown and the discharge time graph at six points along the reach are shown. When the source terms, i.e. the bed slope and friction terms, are much larger than the first three terms in the momentum equation, we ignore the smaller terms and make what is known as a kinematic wave approximation. The momentum equation in this case thus reduces to S0 equals Q mod Q over K squared. That is, gravity forces and friction forces are balanced. This approximation implies steady uniform flow. In this case, the solution will look something like this, where again the graphs of discharge against time are shown for six points along the reach. Now we've seen the equations, Let's think a bit more carefully about the assumptions we made and when they are violated. First, we have the 1D flow assumption. In natural channels, such as rivers and streams, there's often significant meandering, which can result in poor solutions. In particular, flood situations are problematic when water overtops the banks and flows on floodplains as well as in the channel. If the main flow paths can be identified, a looped network of channels can be used to represent flow in a flood situation. Most models are able to deal with looped networks, but many models struggle to deal with dry channels, so that can be a problem. There can also be other difficulties with the discretization. For example, when flow is both on the bank and in the river, the in-bank flow has a longer path than overbank flow. This shorter path implies steeper, faster flows, but 1D models can't account for this. Second, we have the assumption of a constant water level across the cross-section. This assumption breaks down in a number of circumstances, 
For example, in cases of significant curvature, in cases of flowing composite channels. Here we see a couple of examples illustrated, a rising flood and a falling flood, where there's a clear difference in water level across the cross section. Third, we have the assumption of constant velocity across the cross section. In practice, this is never true, but using the average velocity of the cross section can provide a reasonable approximation in many cases. However, in composite channels, there is additional shear stress at the interface between slower and faster bodies, which makes this assumption less valid. It's worth noting that inclusion of floodplain width in the continuity equation but not in the momentum equation can generate more realistic results. Finally, we have the assumption of a gentle bottom slope. This can cause problems if applied to steep slopes even if the flow is subcritical. Frequently models exhibit instabilities in such cases. There are other downsides to 1D hydrodynamic models. First, this type of problem requires a lot of data. For example, to specify initial and boundary conditions and to validate models. This point is becoming less significant with time as more data is available today than used to be. However, there can be complications when you need to transfer data between models and into other means of data storage. Second, some solution schemes have problems dealing with supercritical flows, notably for the type of numerical scheme which many commercial software packages use. There are solution methods available these days that don't have these problems, but they may not be readily available. Finally, the length of simulation may be problematic. There are two factors to consider here. We generally require relatively small time steps. Although some schemes theoretically allow large time steps, the time step often has to be smaller due to factors such as sudden changes in top width or conveyance, or steeper bottom slopes. The second factor is simulation time required for a single time step. Most commercial codes use schemes that were created in the 1960s. These schemes were chosen because they tend to be numerically stable and they do have the advantage that large time steps can be used. But the nature of these schemes is that the solution is lengthy as a system of equations has to be solved at each time step. As I already mentioned, most commercial software packages haven't been updated with new developments over the last few decades so the solution methods are not the most appropriate ones for fast or efficient simulations. None of these downsides preclude using 1D hydrodynamic models and getting useful results from them. However, if you do use them, it's always worth keeping in mind the assumptions that are embedded within them and the effect these may have on your results. In particular, Bear in mind the key assumptions. The water is shallow. It is one-dimensional spatially. The water level across the cross-section is horizontal. The velocity is uniform across the cross-section and doesn't vary with depth. And the bottom slope is small. Happy modelling.